I think uh, the way I think of it is kind of a Lambda gives you a an anonymous backend at the time interval of a request response. Uh, we give you an anonymous backend at the time interval of an entire user session. Hello, welcome to the DevTools FM podcast. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew, and this is my co-host, Justin. Hey, everyone. Uh, our guest today is Paul Butler. Uh, I had the great pleasure of uh, attending Recurse Center with Paul in 2021, uh, and Paul has recently helped co-found a company called Drifting in Space. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but before we dig in, uh, Paul, would you like to tell our audience a little more about yourself? Sure. So uh, I'm, I come from a pretty technical background of uh, studied math in undergrad and then went to a uh, bunch of data science roles at startups and, and went, found my way to New York through uh, a job at Google. Uh, then about, about seven years ago, I left tech and went into finance for uh, close to five years. So I was a quant at a quantitative hedge fund. Um, and then a little over a year ago, left that role uh, wanted to just kind of find something new to do. Uh, went to Recurse, which is where I, I met Justin originally, and uh, and yeah, then around the beginning of the year, started this company, Drifting in Space. That's pretty awesome. Maybe before we talk about Drifting in Space a little bit, we can talk about Recurse Center because may, uh, I've had people ask me questions about it. It's like a lot of people seem to know it, and a lot of people don't. Uh, so generally Recurse Center is this programming retreat, which is usually based out of Brooklyn and, and New York. Uh, but right now I think it's still remote. I don't think they're doing in-person stuff yet. Uh, I'm not sure. I think so. Uh, but it's like an unstructured learning environment, uh, where you can sort of like pursue your own, uh, personal enrichment and work on projects with sort of other like-minded folks. Paul, what was your, what was your experience? How'd you, how'd you like it? Yeah, um, I think so. For me, Recurse was uh, it was something I, I heard a number of people say during the batch. Was like Recurse was great as an excuse not to do anything else. Like it was kind of like an excuse to le leave your job and just code heads down and you know talk to people and be be around like minded people. Um, so for me, a, a lot of ways it was kind of just that it gave me this excuse to leave my job, just do this for a while and. Um, I think it's it's kind of a lot of the value of Recurse is in that permission to do, you know, explore personal projects and that kind of thing for uh, six weeks or 12 weeks. So uh, I got a lot of value out of, uh, you know, that aspect alone. And then, of course, just meeting folks like yourself and uh, doing a lot of pair programming and just exploring different areas that I was uh, interested in and, and had kind of neglected throughout my career. For me, that was things like WebAssembly and WebGPU that really excited me as technologies that I never really had a chance to really dive deep into. Yeah, it was it was a good excuse to like spend time on things that you normally can't justify spending time on. It's like, uh, I don't know, you, you've always curious about some other technologies from on the framework, but you never touch it in your day-to-day -day work. And like, you really have a really hard time justifying, you know, value of putting time into it. Uh, so it was, it was good for that. Uh, it's also interesting how hard an unstructured environment like that can be uh, just like, you know, there's nobody, there's no assignment to complete by any date. There's nobody like, you know, asking you to do a thing. It's just like, just you and whatever you want to do to spend your time. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I, I found it a little unnerving at first and then I really got into the groove of it. So I ended up pretty much continuing that lifestyle uh, for much of last year uh, until Kind of getting towards the end of the year and and having this idea for what became drifting in space and pursuing that cool well maybe we can transition into that uh so tell us a little bit about drifting in space the company and and why you create you created it and and maybe uh why did you call it drifting in space like yeah so the the name drifting in space goes back to before i knew what it was so i i, I just kind of liked that name and uh, i think similar to the kind of recurse theme of of you know drifting through uh, a lot of, you know areas you're interested in, I kind of found that with uh, what I was doing was kind of just exploring, and um, so it came out of that. I liked it, so I kept it. Um, and the product itself is Jamsocket, so we kind of have a, a proper name 
for that or like a, a generic tech name. Um, but we wanted to keep the originality of the, the drifting in space name. Um, and so the, the thing that we're kind of trying to solve is this idea that more and more software is moving into the browser. And it, when you move an application into the browser, you, you end up with this fairly low ceiling in terms of compute and memory use um, in terms of what you can actually do with that. So if you wanted to port an application, a desktop application that uses tens of gigabytes of data, uh, which is something that I encountered in finance. So we were dealing with large data sets. We'd have uh, reasons to kind of build tools around those data sets. But you just can't ship that to Chrome. You know, it, it, WebAssembly itself uh, can't actually allocate currently more than four gigabytes. It's just a structural limitation of being 32-bit. So there's all these reasons, you know, network reasons, compute reasons, memory reasons that you just don't want to do that all in the browser. And you need sort of a second place to do it. Um, the natural second place is, of course, the server, but a traditional stateless server architecture also kind of doesn't really give you a good place to do that. So uh, with Drifting in Space, what we're trying to do is look at this architecture that we've kind of found in the wild that other people uh, are already using, which is basically, we call it session live backends. Basically, each client-side application has a long-lived process for as long as you have that tab open. And then when that tab's closed, we shut down the server, the yeah, the back end. Uh, and our goal is just to make that as easy as possible so that developers are focusing on the application and not the infrastructure. Well, oh, cool. So so it's really it's really like a, a stateful based application. And this almost reminds me a little bit. I mean, I know it's not analog analogous, but I think of like uh, Elixir's live view, that whole the whole aspect of that is interesting because the the client state is actually like all really stored on the server sort of a unifying factor and of course that has a different perspective but like what kind of uh what kind of apps would people want to build with this yeah i think the the inspiration of the the, the erlang elixir beam otp stack is really interesting because like that stack kind of bakes these ideas right into it at, at the core um what we're trying to do is provide that type of functionality to people who maybe for whatever reason don't want to go out and re-implement their application in Erlang or Elixir. Um, so what we, we've kind of done is looked at how things like Visual Studio Code, uh, when you're running it in the client server architecture, how that actually works in the back end, which is that they're spinning up a container or a, a process and your client side is connecting to it and, and has this long-lived connection. Uh, similarly, things like Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, or Jupyter Lab uses a similar architecture. Uh, and we've seen a number of like, private companies or like, proprietary code bases that companies are building that uh, actually follow a similar architectural pattern. So uh, we think it's a good pattern. And our, our kind of bet is that there's going to be more and more applications that are shaped that way. Nice, nice. So. Uh... I think you've created a bunch of different pieces of tech to power this, uh, one of those being Spawner. So what is Spawner and how does it make this session lived application backend easy? Yeah, so Spawner is our open source implementation of this pattern um, that I just described. So the, the pattern is basically, the easiest way to think about it is you hit an API, that API returns a unique host name that it's just generated on the fly. Uh, and then from the client side, you can connect to that host. And you know we're, we're actually ag agnostic to what, how you communicate with that host. It just has to be a browser technology like Fetch, uh, so Event Source, WebSockets. We're soon supporting WebRTC as well. Um, so we just treat it as a, like an HTTP pipe, and then whatever interface to that pipe you use is up to you. Um, and the main thing that we do is spin that back end up and monitor those connections. When there's no more connections, we close that back down. So the idea is when the user closes the tab, we can recycle the resources that were dedicated to it. Help me contextualize this a little more. So so you talked about, you know, maybe like the VS Code example or, you know, how some people might use this they might actually like spin up a container or something in the background. Um, what are like what specifically are you spinning up? Is this just another like process? Like the the application is like forking off a child process or just creating a child process that's like executing some code or something? Like what like concretely is the 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 sort of session 
the app or whatever? E yeah, great question. So concretely today, it is a Docker container. Okay. Um, down the road, we're very interested in the compute actually being like a WebAssembly module or JavaScript module or um, Firecracker uh, instance or, or whatever. Um, so we, we've architected things in a way that's agnostic to that. But concretely, yeah, it's a, it's a Docker container today. You know, it's interesting. This reminds me a lot of the Lambda model. Uh, just like it's a little bit different, right? This is a long-lived thing where a Lambda ideally is a pretty short-lived connection and it's kind of a one-shot. But this is like a... It's is like a intermediate, like longer lived Lambda, if you will, if like you need to do like multiple things with it and keep that session open. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. I think uh, the way I think of it is kind of a Lambda gives you a an anonymous backend at the time interval of a request response. Uh, we give you an anonymous backend at the time interval of an entire user session. Are there any caps on that user session? Is it like, is it five minutes or could it be like five years? Uh, there's no technical cap on it. We we still kind of have to figure out what we do when it comes to spin mm -hmm. down um, because we don't want to keep something, you know, we don't want to keep a server running for five years just because somebody has a browser tab open for five years. So in practice, we encourage an ar application architecture that is resilient to, um, to shut down so we can, you know, implement things in such a way that there's an auto save loop, for example, so that if a backend receives a SIG term, it can, it can shut down gracefully. Um, but strictly speaking, we don't have like a hard cap on the on the length of that. There's a, a AWS service. What is it? Fargate, which is is somewhat similar to this, maybe. Yeah, Fargate is. Um, it's still with so with something like Fargate, you're still not getting a guarantee that you're talking to a backend that's unique to you. Mm, um, right. So they'll spin up a backend as load dictates, but they're not sort of giving a set of users a dedicated backend. Um, and so like one other example of, of why it's useful to have a, this dedicated backend is because ultimately you just, the, the handle that you get to this backend is just a host name that you connect to from the client. Mm -hmm. If you want, you can give that same handle to multiple users and then you, it makes it much easier to implement things like message passing between two clients that are, uh, have relevant state that they're sharing or things like a Figma style, uh, real-time collaboration becomes a lot easier to build in a scalable way. Right, right, right. That's pretty cool. Um, I imagine building a business around this technology is is kind of interesting. So, so we we've seen this a lot in different forums when we're talking to, uh, you know, founders who are creating a tooling company where it's like really you have you have the technology, you have this unique solution, and you're trying to like turn it around and and you know capture a market with it. So. I know you are still pretty early in this, but but sort of how are you thinking about building a business around it and sort of what does that look like? Um, so what we're thinking is that a lot of the teams we talk to who are either interested in using tech like this or have gone down the path of building tech like this tend to be application teams who often don't want to be building this infrastructure. They kind of reluctantly end up in this world of Kubernetes and uh, stapling things together that shouldn't be stapled together. And it, it kind of... Um, I think there's this real pain point. And I think one of the nice things about providing this as infrastructure as a business is that people are used to paying for compute um, and people are used to paying for compute adjacent services. So uh, I, I don't think we kind of are asking, um, you know, asking people to open up their wallet for something that they're not used to, which is often the case with a lot of dev tools. So I think we're fortunate that way. Um, one thing that's that we are exploring as well is kind of this, hosted control plane model where uh, we've actually architected everything in such a way that we can run the, this compute on a user's uh, backends if they want. So it could be bare metal, it could be their EC2 server, their GCP server, um, basically anything that runs Docker. So in that case, it would be more of a uh, fee, you know, a monthly fee for that hosted control plane, a little bit more of a SaaS model because the value add that we would provide there is more, uh, Things like the observability observability layer and um, accounting layer and and some of the stuff that sits on top of it. So, what is working with Jamsocket like? Like, can uh, since it's built on Spawner, could I deploy this on my own, or is Jamsocket doing a lot for me that I wouldn't want to do? 
So the things that Jamsocket's doing for you are things like running a container registry. Um, we have a, an API and a CLI client that go with the Jamsocket side of things. Um, so the spawner side is is pretty D, uh, DIY, and it's intentionally done in that way because it's flexible to do things that are kind of beyond the scope of what we're trying to do with Jamsocket. Uh, an example of that, if, if you wanted to build a deploy preview server, um, that's not something we intend to do with Jamsocket, but Spawner actually provides a nice base for that because it's it allows you to just spin up these anonymous hosts that are serving a container you provide. Um, so on the Jamsocket side, the idea is basically you push a container to us. Uh, that container looks for an environment variable called port, uh, similar to Heroku or Google Cloud, um, that kind of interface, serves an HTTP server on that port, and then we just proxy that uh, based on the host name that we generate on the fly. So you get a REST endpoint, you hit that REST endpoint, it sends back a host name, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, everything else is kind of under the water. We're, we're managing the session lifecycle. We do provide some APIs for observing session lifecycle, getting events and that sort of thing, uh, as well as introspecting logs and uh, some of the dev tooling as well. This include things just like authentication and everything? as a built-in aspect of it? Uh, we So we authenticate users to our platform, but we don't provide authentication for the end user's application. Um, our approach in general to everything really is we, we kind of try to stay out of the developer's way. Um, so we're not, we're not trying to impose uh, any storage solution, any authentication solution, any secret sharing solution. The idea is that you can lean on other uh, either tools that you already use uh, cloud vendors, if you're hosting on a cloud vendor, um, you can kind of bring that existing tool set and we're just giving you the session live layer. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Do you have any clients yet? Like, uh, is anybody building cool stuff on Jamsocket? Yeah. So uh, we're sort of at the stage where we are kind of a little bit past our own MVP. So we're like minimal viable products. We're still fairly early on. Um, we do have people building on it. And we're we're reaching. I mean, we're getting more and more comfortable with going into production on it. Um, there's a company called Rayon, it's Rayon Design, that's building kind of a Figma style multiplayer CAD application on it. Um, and there's a few people using it for launching Jupyter notebooks and things like that. Um, one of the nice things about the architecture being so unopinionated is that things like um, Visual Studio Code and Jupyter notebooks are pretty easy to deploy on it, even using containers that other people have built that are not specifically designed for um, for Jamsocket. So uh, we see a lot of, I think those, that's kind of the low, lower hanging fruit use case for us right now. Uh, the the company I work at right now, Descript, kind of has like, we do ha do this like remote, uh, like session backed application, but I don't think so as heavily. And I think an approach like this could really, really help us because we eventually want to move from having an Electron app that heavily relies on the system to a fully like Figma-like web experience. And these session-lived backends seemed like a, a, a quite a nice solution. Yeah, actually the Electron kind of as a starting point is a really nice one for us because Electron itself is built internally in kind of this client server uh, mm -hmm. sort of way, right? Where you have internally there's a node process and a, a front end process. So uh, one thing, that you could do is kind of basically split out so the node part runs on the back end and all the message passing just happens uh, over the network instead of over a local stream. So um, yeah, I think that that type of thing is a really good fit for us. Um, just just sort of think that talking about it broadly. So you mentioned earlier that like, so Spawner is using basically Docker containers right now and, and that there's potential options for, for other things in the futures. I mean, you know, again, like thinking back to lambdas or like, uh, or, you know, even like Cloudflare functions or something. I, I, I think back to just like V8 isolates as being a, a really interesting target for this sort of thing. Um, having like semi long lived V8 executions. Um, my sort of question is, is like Spawner like specifically tied to the notion of Docker containers or is it like something that you would like to refactor in the future to be more flexible or is like, you know, from the architecture perspective, is it like sort of married to that notion at the moment? No. So we, so actually started as a, started building it on Kubernetes. And so the first prototype on Kubernetes, 
And then one of the reasons we moved away from that was because the idea of containers is so embedded in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, even though parts of Kubernetes, like the scheduler and, and that sort of thing, are not necessarily um, super container aware, just the fact that everything about Kubernetes and, and the ecosystem around it is so, uh, so container-based that we decided that we're not sure that, that containers are the future. I'm, I actually started even before the Kubernetes approach, attempting something like this with uh, WebAssembly and built something that worked. So I, I kind of proved out the concept with WebAssembly, moved over to, to Kubernetes because, um, well, I mean, I mentioned the, the four gig limit and there's just, WebAssembly is still early. I love it. I think it's like, it's here to stay, but it's just early to be building these compute intensive applications on. Um, so yeah, I'm really bullish on on something like WebAssembly. Uh, isolates are also really interesting to me. I think um, that's something that we would like to support um, down the road as well. I'm sure they have a lot of their own constraints, so I don't think they're really intended to be as long lived as I'm sure you know, this is open for. It's cool though. Yeah, and another nice thing about the containers is just that people had already built things in containerized ways, so we didn't have to invent interfaces with the operating system or anything like that. Yep, yep. And it just as you as you move away from uh, from the cutting edge, or, or I guess as you move towards the cutting edge, you kind of end up um, having to invent more. And we're not opposed to inventing, but we're just sort of one step at a time. So you talked a little bit about WebAssembly for our our listeners who might not be all that familiar with it. Uh, why is it such an interesting technology to you? So what I like about WebAssembly, well, I guess going back to the problem, like one of the main problems we have with containers is cold start time. Um, so containers are often in, in the real world when they're used, they're used in systems where um, things can be scaled up and down over time. And if it takes 10 seconds or a minute to start a container, nobody really cares. Everything just has to be eventually consistent. With what we're doing with containers, there's actually every time we start a container, there's a user waiting to interact with it. So that cold start time of getting to the first interaction for a user is vital to us. Um, so with, with WebAssembly, the nice thing, uh, just sort of a technical description, WebAssembly is a bytecode language that can run in the browser and you can compile various languages uh, to it. So it's kind of like, a, I mean, as the name implies, like an assembly language for the web. Um, the one of the nice things about it is because it was designed to run in the browser, it's both fast to start up, because that was one of the real design requirements of it, um, and it's also naturally very sandboxed, where you, you don't have to worry about um, it touching things that it shouldn't touch. You, you kind of explicitly have to give it access to any resource, whether that's network, memory, uh, even the system time, you have to pass in and, and not necessarily explicitly, like there's um, interfaces, WASI is the big one to, to kind of pass in system resources, but the idea is you have complete control. So uh, it's very lightweight and it's it's just, a, I think, a really well-designed um, kind of, they took a lot of the stuff that people have learned over the last 20 years with VMs and uh, kind of turned it into something that is what you would build if you were starting from scratch like they were. Cool. That's awesome, yeah. So uh, I've just been looking at some of the stuff that y'all have done, and I noticed that you also have this other library, uh, Rust library called Aper, uh, and the sort of headline is like Git for your data structures. Uh, could you explain a little bit like what that is and why you build it, and if it plays into this you know, other product, Jamstack, that you've been talking about? So where Aper comes in is if you want to synchronize two Rust data structures uh, or a Rust data structure between two or more machines, um, and the approach that Aper takes is it basically flattens the data structure into something that can be treated as a an append-only data structure by transforming it into a state machine. So, for example, if you wanted to have a list, uh, instead of representing it just as a, a straight list, you can represent it as a series of actions like add to this list, remove from this list, uh, reorder elements in this list, things like that. The nice thing about that is you can actually apply that type of, that same thing to an, an arbitrarily complex data structure. Uh, so as long as you, it basically reduces the problem of synchronizing the, any data structure into the problem of synchronizing an append-only list, which is a, 
fairly solved problem in computer science. One of the use cases for that is you can go back and forwards in time in a data structure. You can always uh, kind of pop things off the end of that list and look at what the state would have been uh, by recomputing from the beginning if you need to. Uh, but also you can just send those transitions between multiple nodes in a network, and then each of those nodes has a copy of the same data structure in memory. Before we move on, uh, does Aper uh, relate back to Spawner at all? Sort of, yeah. So uh, Aper was actually the first piece of this that I started working on. And it originated from, during COVID, I started writing a game for my family to play over Zoom calls. And so we would all go into the game and um, we would each see our own screen. And it was kind of a boggle-like word game. I was doing uh, doing word games for my family before Word Alert was a thing. Um, and the, I wanted to make it available to other people. And I realized that scaling a WebSocket-based server was really hard. Um, so Aper was actually extracted from that code base originally. Um, and then that observation that doing a WebSocket server was really hard is kind of what set me on the path to uh, to building Spawner and JamSocket. Oh, that, that, that's an awesome story that just building a game for your family spawned uh, both of these things and potentially even the company you work at now. It's funny how frequently that happens. Uh, so we had interviewed uh, Jared, who's creating Bun, and it was a similar sort of story. It's like he was making a game and he's like, oh, these tools are so slow. I'm going to fix that and created Bun. Yeah, games are great because they're so self-contained. Yeah. Uh, so why Rust? Uh, I, I'm thinking that a lot of these things that we've just talked about are created in Rust. So why, why do you think it's the programming language of the future? Yeah, so uh, Rust is... I started programming Rust in about 2018 uh, in my free time just because I... Um, I'd done a little bit of functional programming in the past and, and some of these languages that really are thoughtful about types, things like Haskell and uh, OCaml. And I kind of always liked exercising that part of my brain and always felt, in my day job, I was doing a lot of Python and felt that there was something missing there in the expressiveness that I had with types. So um, when an opportunity arose to do some Rust, I, I started doing it um, and ended up doing it for a number of kind of free time projects. Uh, got to the point in uh, 2021, where I realized that if I was going to be an, a Rust expert, I had to just commit to doing it full time. I couldn't really go back and forth between Rust and Python. Um, and so that was one of the reasons that I left my job. Uh, and <laughs> all I really knew was that I was really interested in the web and I was really interested in Rust. Um, so what I like about Rust is um, I think it's a natural evolution of other system programming languages. Like I think it's a uh, I think it's it's kind of like what you would create right now if you're just trying to create an ergonomic programming language in a lot of ways. And then it has all this like memory safety stuff that you kind of have to deal with as well. But it, it kind of teaches you computer science almost as you do it. Like even though there's a learning curve with it, I always feel like I've learned something not just about Rust, but about computation when I get past a, one of those hurdles. So I like that about Rust. Uh, have you played around with any of like the the Rust crates for web development? Uh, Justin shared a few here on the podcast. Uh, I've played around with uh, U is one of them, Y-E-W. Uh, I quite like that. It, it feels like a natural uh, thing to go to from having done some React. Um, so the, actually the game that I mentioned, the um, word game was built with U in Rust. Um, that's probably the main one. And then I've written a few of my own to deal with um, Things like WebGL. Nice, nice. So, uh, I mean, a lot of the work that you're doing uh, with so uh, Ape Spawner or Aper and Spawner are all open source, um, and, it, and it seems like Spawner is like a big part of this, you know, JamSocket product that you're building. So, uh, as you're building this business, uh, how is open source positioned in your mind, and like, why are you doing stuff open source now, and and what is your sort of plans? for open source stuff in the future. Yeah, uh, we tend to, to kind of think of things as open source by default, unless we have a good reason not to. Um, so we've really just, at this point, kind of kept the proprietary platform to be closed source. And pretty much everything else is either open source or we have plans to open source it once we clean it up a bit. So um, 
I think that just kind of comes from our background. So we're very open source heavy people. We're obviously building on top of a lot of open source and we want to contribute that back. Um, but also kind of more strategically, I do think that there's an opportunity to kind of build the, the Kubernetes of this ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of dividends you get just by um, kind of not letting that fall to a big cloud company. Um, so I think like the, the natural, if we didn't do this, this would be something that that Amazon or Google would own. And I think we kind of have this unique point in time where we can uh, we can get something out there and get adoption before they do. So um, that's that's kind of the, the strategy with open source. Yeah, and then since since you're making it, it's not like the the actual secret sauce is still hidden because like uh, with like Basil, like sure, there's a lot of it that, that's open source, but like it really isn't open source. So it's cool that you're doing it. Yeah, and we've been trying to kind of do everything in the open as much as possible. It's there's that kind of can be at odds with iterating quickly. So at this stage, there's still things that we've kind of done in the proprietary code base and we're, we're kind of moving out as we have time to uh, to sort of solidify them and, and document them. But our goal going forward is to be, uh, the way I kind of think of it in my head is is kind of like the proprietary platforms like GitHub and the open source piece is like Git. Um, not that those both come from the same company, but um, yeah. that we kind of have that separation where it's a, it's a freestanding tool. It's not like, um, you know, in contrast to something like Pulumi, where the tool is so integrated with the platform that you can't really untie them. Uh, we want it to always be sort of a freestanding open source project that you could use and never talk to us. And, you know, we've, we're okay with that. Like that's kind of that we're happy that you're ultimately using something that uh, gives us distribution and, and gets our name out there too. Yeah, that's cool. This is like, this is sort of a category defining thing. I'm thinking, you know, it reminds me very much of like, if you think just sort of like the early days of Vercel and that sort of early integration with like, we'll make Lambda easier or uh, Temporal is another good example of this is like, well, we're going to make orchestrator workflow sort of easier. This, this seems to be another one of those category defining things where it's like you have a session service and we're going to make it really easy for you. Um, that's, pretty exciting man that's it's a it's a cool thing yeah that's my hope i mean those are both companies that i hold in high esteem um so it would, it would be a great company to be part of so this is a question that we asked uh, of most of our guests uh in some shape or form uh what do you think the future of the web looks like and how we will build it in the future because it seems like as justin said we have all these different technologies that are kind of just burgeoning how do you think it'll shake out so I think what we're already sort of starting to see is this bifurcation of web development. Want to hear Paul's answer? Well, the rest of this interview, as well as a bunch of bonus content, is only available to our Patreon subscribers. For just $5 a month, you get access to full-length ad-free episodes, you'll be able to vote on future guests, and you can come join us in our Discord community. There, we'll be hosting an exclusive Q&A with Paul to answer all your burning questions. Want to be even more involved? Join one of our higher tiers and become part of episode planning and help shape the episodes as they come out. We hope you join us. Be sure to like and follow the podcast. Thanks for listening.